please welcome Marco Rubio. better than Marco because then people say polo, it's really annoying. <laughs> First of all, it's really great to be in a, I don't often get to speak in a room that has a DJ booth, so it's good to have uh, And I'm really great, to, it's great to be with all of you. And in particular, great to be with uh, the future of America, which is what all of you represent, uh, all of you represent, but especially the students that attend here. And I'm going to try to be brief because I know you got to get back to studying or, yeah, whatever it is you're doing. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, but it's great to be with you in this in this uh, lead up to this important election. You're very fortunate whether you're from Iowa or you live somewhere else and you're here now, you're very fortunate to be in a state that's gonna begin the process of choosing the next president. What I hope to do over the next 15 or 12 minutes is not just convince you that I'm the right person for the job, but to convince you to participate in it. Because this election is not just a normal election. We will choose the next president and that's important. But this election actually has turned into a referendum about our identity as a people and as a nation because you and I share a very uncertain time. You see, uh, when I was your age, gosh, I can't believe I'm saying that. When I was your age, <laughs> the economy we lived in was very different. The world I grew up in is very different than the world that exists now. Economically, it was a different place. We didn't have a global economy. America was one of the few places on earth where anyone would dare do business. And so when that existed, it wasn't a good idea to have taxes that were too high or regulations that were too burdensome or a government that was too big. It wasn't a good idea, but we could get away with some of it because there just weren't that many places in the world where you could open up a business. We were it. That isn't the case anymore. We now live in an economy that is a global one. We have to compete with, partner with, collaborate with, trade with, sell to, and buy from people all over the world. The economy that you will inherit when you leave school is an economy very different than the one I grew up in. It's an economy where your business partners, your clients, your customers, your collaborators, and your competitors are just as likely to live halfway around the world as they do halfway across town. The second thing that's different about this economy is it's driven by innovation. It used to be that you came up with a great idea and it was still a great idea 10 years later. You come up with a great idea now and within two to three years someone came up with a better idea. That's how fast the pace of innovation has been. And the result of these two dramatic changes in our economy has been disruption. This always happens when there's an economic revolution, and that's what we're having. This is not just an economic downturn. This is a massive restructuring of our economy. And every time that's happened, it's been really disruptive. The Industrial Revolution was incredibly disruptive. The Industrial Revolution took millions of people out of farms and put them into factories. It took millions of people out of the countryside and put them into cities, and it was disrupted. It wiped out industries. Industries that had existed for hundreds of years were gone. Jobs that had existed for 100 years were gone, and it was disruptive. But it also created new industries and new jobs, and the new industries that it created made more money than the old industries. The new jobs it created paid more than the old jobs. But it was a, a challenge, and we're grateful they went through that challenge, because that Industrial Revolution changed the world. In many ways, it's what allowed America to win the Second World War. We were able to mass produce things, but it was not easy. Well, what we are living through now is like the Industrial Revolution, except it's not going to happen over the next 50 to 100 years. It's happening in increments of three to five years. And if you don't believe me, go back in your journals, diaries, or old emails, and you will find things you were talking about five or three years ago that don't even exist anymore. They've been replaced by something else. You want to know how fast the world is changing? Think about it this way. I've said this before. When they invented the telephone, that was an enormous invention. It took 75 years for there to be 100 million people using telephones. It took Candy Crush one year to reach 100 million users. So that's how fast the world is changing. It's a global economy, it's rapidly evolving, and our government policies are from yesterday. We try to regulate these new industries as if they were old industries. We have government policies that are completely outdated. We have a retirement system in America that was designed in the 1930s. We have a higher education system that was designed in the 1950s. We have energy policies from the 1970s. We have anti-poverty programs that don't cure poverty that were designed in the 1960s. All of our policies are outdated and so are many of our leaders. Too many of the people that are making decisions for this country do not understand the 21st century. They approach 21st century issues with 20th century ideas and 20th century concepts. And the result is people are being left behind. 
Now, I'm not here to tell you America isn't still a great country. It is still a great country. You know how I know that? Because the richest people in China buy American real estate. Because the richest people around the world send their children to our schools. We remain the greatest country in the world, but we are not fulfilling our potential. We can be doing so much better than what we're doing now, and we are being held back. Partially because of ideology and the mistakes of current leaders, but primarily because we have outdated policies from a time that came and went. One of the most important things that our next president must do is be a leader in modernizing American economic policies to reflect the 21st century. Policies that allow us to be globally competitive. Policies that allow us to be the most innovative place in the world now and for the foreseeable future. Policies that allow the American private sector not just to create new jobs, but jobs that pay more than the jobs that are being created now. It's not enough to just create jobs. You gotta create jobs that pay more. We're not doing any of that right now. This is why I'm for tax reform. The tax reform debate used to be about ideology, more taxes, less taxes. Today it's about competitiveness. We can't compete with the global economy if we have the most expensive business taxes in the world. There are just too many other countries now that are fighting for us, fighting with us for that business. That's why every day when you open up a newspaper, another American company is moving its headquarters overseas. Because they can make more money over there than here. Here, we charge them the highest combined corporate tax rate in the world. And that tax rate is not making us money, it's costing us money. When they move these companies, they move thousands of jobs with them. We're the only developed economy on the planet that has a territorial, a worldwide system of taxation. You know what that means? If you're an American company, and you make a million dollars in Europe, you have to pay the European taxes. But then if you bring that money back to create a job here for you, they gotta pay taxes on that money a second time. No one's gonna do that. So you know what they do instead? They leave their money in Europe. That money's parked in a bank account over there or being invested over there. You know how much money is that is? Two trillion dollars of American corporate profits is sitting overseas, being invested in another country or saved in another country, all because of this tax policy. You know what two trillion dollars is? It is equivalent to the size of the entire Russian economy. That is what two trillion dollars is. There is a role for regulations, by the way. None of us wants to drink poisonous water. None of us wants to eat unsafe food. None of us wants to take medicine that isn't what it says on the bottle. None of us want to fly in an airplane where the two people flying it are not really pilots, they just stayed at the Holiday Inn Express. So, <laughs> there's a proper role for regulations, but what happens when regulations go too far? What happens when regulations make you as a business buy a $100,000 piece of equipment? That's $100,000 you can't use to hire people. That's a cost, it's like a tax. And we have regulations that are completely out of control. They add over a billion dollars a week of new regulatory costs. And no one is doing the cost benefit. What's the good of this regulation versus what's the cost of it to see if it makes sense? That's why I support a regulatory budget that caps how much regulations can cost our economy. So if they want to add a new regulation, they're going to have to cut an existing one. At least bring some balance to this process. By the way, you know who really loves these regulations? The big business and established industries. They love regulations because they use it as a weapon. I mean, a real life example is what's happening in the sharing economy. I've been talking about this for three years. You know what keeps Uber out of many economies in, in this country, a lot of many cities? An established industry, usually the taxi cab companies. There's an existing regulation that says the only people that can drive you from point A to point B for a profit are the owners of this medallion. They influence the political process to make that the law and keep it the law. And this new idea can never happen. So you've got people in Miami where I live, some of them are being threatened with being arrested for driving an Uber car. Again, this is a small scale example of how innovation is stifled by regulations that are used by established industries to keep people out. One of the issues I think you probably care a lot about is the national debt, and you should. This country owes $19 trillion, and there is no plan to pay for it. The only way that it's ever gonna be paid for if it continues this way is they're gonna to have to raise taxes so high that our economy could potentially collapse under its weight. Even if we did that, we couldn't raise enough taxes to pay that debt. If next year we took 100% of the earnings of every millionaire in America, you wouldn't even make a dent on the national debt. That's how big it's become. But it's worse. That national debt is 19 trillion, but our unfunded liabilities are 100 trillion. Which means that the way Medicare and Social Security are currently structured, by the time I retire, not to mention by the time you retire, it will not exist. It won't exist unless something happens. Here's the good news. We don't have to change anything for the people that are on it now. My mom's on Medicare. My mom's on Social Security. I don't want to see her hurt. And the good news is if we act now, we don't have to change anything for her. But it's going to look different for you and me.
I promise you it's going to look different one way or the other. We have over a trillion dollars of student loan debt in America. A lot of it is held by people that fall in the following category. Your parents aren't rich, so they can't pay for it. But they aren't poor enough, so you don't qualify for financial aid. And so you're stuck right in the middle. And now you got to take out loans, and you can get work study and all that, but then you got to take out the loans. And in graduate school, which most people now need to go to, it gets really big. So I've taken a real interest in this issue. And I've proposed three bipartisan ideas that deal with it. One is to make income-based repayment the automatic method of repaying loans. And why do I say that? Because I'd much rather collect $20 from someone every month than nothing. If you collect nothing, you are ruining their credit, and you're not collecting anything. Second, I think we need alternatives to student loans. And that alternative should be a student investment plan, especially useful for graduate students. So you're going on into a biomedical degree or biosciences or some high-end field, it's going to cost you over $100,000. But what if you could go to a private investment group that pays your tuition, and in exchange, you promise to pay them back a percentage of your income for a defined number of years? No different than investing in a small company. Why is that better than a loan? Because all the risk is on them. If, they, if you are able to pay them back because you made enough money, they made a great investment. If you don't, you drop out, you go on to something else, and you never make the money, they, they made a bad investment. But it doesn't go on your credit rating. It's not one of those things that sticks with you, even if you declare bankruptcy. And for many students, that going to graduate school it is a better alternative than student loans. The third thing I propose is called right to know before you go. This is also bipartisan, and it's very straightforward. And what it says is that before you take out a student loan, no matter for what, community college, four-year degree, graduate school, the school has to tell you. This is how much people make when they graduate from our school with the degree that you're seeking. So you have some inf information about whether it's worth borrowing all of this money to pay for a degree that may not lead to a job. Now in my case, I've majored in poli-sci because I wanted to do something I had an interest in. I'd have a high enough GPA to go to college. I know poli-sci majors don't make a lot of money, at least not with a four-year degree. But I understood what my plan was. I'm not, we're not going to ban any majors, but at least people have information before they take out thousands of dollars that will be with you until you pay it off or until you die. And the alternative, what we are doing is we are locking people out. With a trillion dollars of student loan debt, a significant percentage of it already in default, you know what that means? Ruined credit ratings. And you know what that means? You can't start a business because no one will lend you money to start a business. You can't buy a home because no one will lend you money to start a home, to, to buy a home. You're stuck and have no idea how you're ever going to pay it off. If we can do these two things, I am telling you, this economy will take off. If we give our private sector what they need to succeed, and they give our people a faster and cheaper access to the skills they need, we're not going to have an economic recovery. We're going to have an economic renaissance. There is no country in the world better prepared than ours for this 21st century economy. We are the most creative and innovative people on this planet. We are the hardest and most productive workers in the world. There's no nation on earth that can compete with us. And the good news about the new economy is it's not a zero-sum game. In essence, we can succeed and so can live in a world today that's increasingly dangerous. And it's not just ISIS, and I'll talk about that in a moment. North Korea is governed by a lunatic. Yeah, he's a lunatic. But he has two dozen nuclear warheads. The Chinese are undergoing the most rapid military expansion in the history of the world. And they're using that to take over the South China Sea, which should matter to you because 40% of global commerce goes through the South China Sea. I promise you there are things all over this room that were shipped through the South China Sea. They're trying to take it over. International waters. Russia, is so, under Vladimir Putin, is sowing instability in Europe and now in the Middle East. Iran is governed by a Shia cleric who has this apocalyptic vision of the future. And he's about to get $150 billion of sanctions relief that he will use to sponsor terrorism, to buy a nuclear or build a nuclear warhead, and to build long-range missiles that can reach the United States. These are significant threats. And then you add to that the risk of radical jihadists. And it is a real risk. And it threatens the world, including the Muslim world, is threatened by these radical jihadists. ISIS, in particular, is an apocalyptic group. And I encourage you to do the research on what I'm about to tell you. ISIS has a monthly publication that if you looked at it, you would say this thing was produced on Madison Avenue. This thing was made in an ad agency in New York. It's a professionally done monthly online magazine named The Beak, D-A-B-I-Q. The Beak is the name they chose for the magazine because The Beak is the name of a city in northern Syria where according to ISIS and their interpretation of their faith, that is the city where the apocalypse is going to happen, where the West is going to fight against them and lose, and they will then impose a global caliphate.
Now, for you, this may say, well, who cares what they believe? They're halfway around the world and they're nuts. The reason why you should care is twofold. Number one, this is what they use to recruit people. This is how they radicalize people. They tell them, you're not just joining ISIS, you're joining this apocalyptic army. And the second is it tells you they're not going to go away. People that believe that don't decide one day to become stockbrokers or open a chain of car washes. They are going to do this until they either win or die. This is a very significant threat. And they continue to grow in their presence. They control <coughs> substantial territory in Iraq and, and, and in Syria, increasingly in Libya. They're involved now in Afghanistan. They're starting to pop up in Yemen. They're actively looking for ways to attack in Jordan. They understand our visa programs as well as, any, as many American immigration lawyers, and they're using ways to try to exploit our visa systems. They're trying to use the trafficking networks in South America to tra traffic in people across the border. And they're trying to radicalize people here in the United States, including an individual who last week in California slaughtered 14 people and wounded 20 others in the biggest terrorism attack in America since 9-11. And that guy, of the two people, that guy is a US citizen, born and raised in America, who somehow became radicalized and took action, building pipe bombs and killing people. This is a very dangerous situation we face, and it has to be confronted. And there are multiple ways we need to confront it. We need to know more about them and learn more about them. We need the cooperation of the Muslim community in the United States. They're gonna see some of this radicalization first. We need to do all sorts of things, work with our allies in the region. But it all begins by having the capability to confront it. ISIS cannot be defeated simply with airstrikes. In fact, no war can simply be won with airstrikes. They're going to have to be confronted on the ground. And we're going to have to participate. Now, the bulk of that force is going to have to be local forces. It's going to take Sunni Arabs themselves to defeat them. Why? Because we need them to reject them ideologically, but also because the territory we're trying to claim back from ISIS is Sunni territory. The Kurds are phenomenal. They're doing a great job of holding Kurdish territory. But Kurds cannot liberate Sunni villages and cities. Only Sunnis can do that. And we need to work with our Sunni allies in the region to make that happen. And we'll participate. We'll increase airstrikes. We'll put special operation forces alongside them to improve those airstrikes and help with training and logistics and special operations. But the bulk of the fight has to be local forces. And we should expect more from Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan and the UAE and the Gulf Kingdoms, oil-rich countries that have the money and the men to fight this war and to defeat ISIS. But it will take American global leadership, and we have no choice. This is not an issue that will go away on its own. And it threatens the whole world. ISIS does not just consider Jews and Christians to be heretics. They consider Hindus to be heretics and Buddhists to be heretics. They consider Shia Islam, uh, Muslims to be heretics. They consider Sunni Muslims that don't live the way they want them to to be heretics. They are a danger to the whole world, and it will take American leadership to put together the resources to defeat them, which means we must also rebuild our military. Now, I'm not telling you that there isn't waste in the Pentagon, because there is. And every dollar that's wasted in the Pentagon is a dollar that isn't defending you. We have a civilian workforce at the Defense Department that's too big. We, have, we spend way too much on buying things like computers. We pay a lot more than you would ever pay, and a lot more than a business would ever pay. These things have to be fixed. I am telling you, we do not have a trillion dollars of waste, and that's what's going to be cut over the next 10 years. And the implications of those cuts is the following. If we go through with those cuts, we are going to have the smallest and the oldest Air Force we have ever had. We are going to have the smallest and oldest Navy we have ever had. And we are going to have an Army that's already too small being reduced by another 40,000 positions. It makes no sense to me that in the face of all these growing dangers I've just outlined, that we reduce our capabilities to confront them. And the last point, and one of the greatest lessons of history, is if you truly want peace, then you must have the strength to protect that peace. But nothing is a bigger enemy of peace than weakness. It invites miscalculation. I encourage you to look at the lessons of history. Each and every time that these sorts of movements have taken traction in the world, it has been taking advantage of weakness, both military and moral. We should also, by the way, be engaged in the world. I always end up, uh, I hope that this generation of Americans remains as idealistic as those that came before you. Because a lot of times people say, well, cut foreign aid. Foreign aid is less than 1% of our budget. But foreign aid can make a difference when properly used. And if you ever have a chance, travel to the African continent. And you will meet people who are alive today because the American taxpayer funded antiviral HIV medications that kept them alive. It will not be easy to radicalize people who are alive because the American taxpayers saved their lives and the lives of their children. Are we still a country where people can do for their children what my parents did for me? 
what your parents did for you. If we are, then the greatest era in American history is before us. And if we are not, then we will be guilty of losing the most exceptional nation that has ever existed. That is the choice in this election. That's why your participation is so important. You are not just choosing a president. You are choosing a future. You are choosing an identity. You are being asked to choose what kind of country do you want America to be. And I am telling you, it can be greater than it's ever been if we do what needs to be done now. If we do what needs to be done, the American dream that changed the world and my life and yours, that American dream won't just survive. We can make it reach more people and change more lives than ever before. And the 21st century will not just be as good as the 20th century, it will be better. It will be the theme of my campaign, a new American century. So I hope I can encourage you not just to turn out in caucus, but to do so for me, because together you and I can be the authors of the greatest chapter and the amazing story of the greatest country in the history of all mankind. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for having me. Good luck tonight. Just, uh, like